So I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, we'll go around the room and do introductions, and I think Felix is trying to call in, but might not be able to at the moment. Um, Suzanne LeBrance. Austin Quinn Davidson. Ben Slater. Juna Penny, Director of Employee Benefits for this Valley Bank. And Ben, are you from the Vera Clinic? Yes, or I where are you from? Okay, great. Based on Seattle. Okay, thank you. And I'm Sheree Hendricks with the uh, Consultant for the Municipality Bank Branch from the Wilson Agency. That's right. Well, I'll work on that. I'm Brandon Natasha Penny of the Health Department. I guess we could go ahead and get started with an update from Ms. Pineda um, about the Anchorage Health Department. Um, so I'll just tick through our list. We, as you guys may be aware, we have seven um, commissions that the Health Department has some oversight for. Uh, Animal Control Board has a meeting coming up um, on October 24th at 5.30. The Memorial Park Cemetery had their meeting, I believe, two days ago. Uh, things are moving along there. There was one comment that was maybe important to the assembly. Uh, there's been a, a, a regular request and, and interest from the Memorial Park uh, Advisory Board for the municipality to put some funds towards their um, bell tower project, and that has not happened yet, so you may hear from um, some of the members uh, that were at that meeting that came back to us. The Health and Human Services Committee met recently. They're um, working closely with the Youth Advisory Committee and having some youth participation, um, as well as looking at some um, resolutions that they'll be bringing forward to the body, uh, probably at the full assembly meetings. The Hand Commission um, has been working on a response to a request from Felix Rivera of the assembly um, on an annual report that you have requested. Um, and other than that, that's generally the update from the commissions. Um, one thing to note is we're looking just at the spread of the number of commissions we have and the staff that we have. Um, over the last, I think, eight to 10 years, we've gone from 160 staff to about 105. And so we have a lot of commissions and um, limited resources. So we're looking at um, how those commissions all work. So we'll be continuing to evaluate all of that and we'll probably be bringing something forward in the next year or so. Uh, PIO activities. Can I ask a question? Can I ask oh, yeah. So, do you think that you might be consolidating some of the commissions or just not it's really sure? It's worth considering, yet. yeah. So, I'm going to be looking okay. at all of their, looking at it, talking with them, and looking at all their responsibilities. Some of their responsibilities, for example, the Hand Commission has a vast number of responsibilities that really are tied to the COC that they don't have. What's COC? Oh, the Continuum of Care Fund okay. that are now housed at the Anchorage Coalition and Homelessness. Mm -hmm. So they have a lot of responsibilities um, that are in their code and in their agreements that don't necessarily apply to them anymore. So we're just going to be looking at all of them and doing a full analysis. I don't assume, you know, what action I would recommend but I will be looking at it um, as a part of efficiencies as well. Like I have staff one of the commissions. We have the only two that have actual um, employees with position descriptions that have, like Michael Tierney's 30% of his time is actually attributed to the Animal Control mm -hmm. Board. Cause that's how much, I mean, a huge amount of his work time is as consumed with Animal Control Board issues as you guys probably already know. Um, so we're just trying to make sure that we're staffing them in a way that allows them to be effective and in cases where we can't, that we evaluate that and bring it forward to the administration and the assembly. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So, um, Ms. Pineda, you said your staff has been reduced from 160 to 105. And is that just generally, or are there certain areas of your department like that you totally cut out? Or yeah, I don't bring it with me, but That's there are total, there will be total sections that will remove total areas that either the state stopped funding or the partnership um, of the, the city operating stopped funding and um, Dan has mapped that out. So we kind of know, um, you know, when our budget goes up and down based on when like a new part comes into it or leaves it. Uh, and we, you know, keep track of how many FTEs we have, and that's a combined FTEs between the operating funds and grant funds. Um, so it's just a over time of cutting of any assistant positions, of any support positions, and just as all of the departments throughout the city have done, I'm sure. And that's since when the 160? I believe it's since 2006, but I don't want to be. No, that's okay. I can 
can, yeah, I think so. Yeah. And I can no, don't worry. bring more in the future. So we have a new PIO that started. Wow. <laughs> he, like, he would like that sound associated with this start. <laughs> so we have Barry Pfizer started on October 7th. Um, and he has been busy since he started already. We, um, as some of you may have read in the news, there was a recent arrest of two opioid prescribers in Eagle River and Saldana. And the Anchorage Health Department has joined the Alaska Department of Health and Social Services in a coordinated effort to assist in addressing um, physical and behavioral health needs for individuals with discontinued prescriptions. So the state has formed an opioid health action response that has multiple subgroups, including um, some that are interesting to us, and I think Juna, I'll be keeping her up to date on um, communications to patients and insurers. Our staff will be actively respond, uh, involved in um, community response and engagement, so that'll be ongoing, and um, we'll let you know what kind of outcomes come from that in the future. There's lots of literature or, or kind of guidance coming out from the state. We'll be sharing that. Um, the cemetery, always an exciting part of this update. We had um, we have had a total of 175 burials this year, which eclipses our 2018 total. And with two and a half months to go, our cemetery director thinks it'll be our busiest year on record. We don't know really why. Um, the other thing that they have recently just completed their grave installation and finished 175 marker installations for this season. So they were very busy in addition to the bell tower that's building, I think I shared in May, they'll hope that you'll come to a, an opening. Natasha, would you mind just a second? So is Mr. Rivera on the line? I am, yeah. Oh, can you turn that up? Just a Thank you. So we've been joined by Mr. Rivera on the phone. Go ahead, sorry about that. No, no problem. Uh, so Division of Administration, we recently had a break-in and had multiple security concerns at the building, including a break-in and um, somebody living in our mobile intervent our mobile um, clinic. And so we've been working on enhanced building security and looking into what we need there. I think we're not, um, we're just like any business downtown, I think, that experiences some of those challenges during this transition season. So we'll be working on increasing security in the building. Uh, we are continuing to work with our HIPAA privacy policy efforts and hope that will be completely done um, by January, no later than January of this year. Um, our emergency shelter incident report is under development and expected to be ready for piloting um, by the beginning of the, the Beans and Shelter project. So the plan is to actually test out this new incident report for a couple of months with a shelter provider to see how it works and see how much responsibility, like how much time it's gonna take on our end before we create our internal policies and procedures. Accepting this kind of new data around death or injury um, also makes us responsible um, for responding and addressing it. So we really wanna make sure we get that right. So we'll be piloting that um, hopefully in November. Uh, grants and Contracts is processing all of the Human Services Community Matching Grants now that you guys just uh, approved them last week. So those will be going out to all of those organizations in short order as fast as we can get them out. Um, I won't do any, do you guys feel like you need an animal control update or do you feel like you have enough information? Well, we do, but I don't know that everyone okay. here does, okay. so you might as well do. So representatives from the Anchorage Health Department, the Municipal Attorney's Office, Animal Control Advisory Board, and the contractors met on October 10th at the um, Title 17 subcommittee meeting to discuss concerns from animal rescue groups and there were changes to the AO that are in process and expected to be submitted in an S1 version for public hearing on November 5th. That's the latest. And again, they have a meeting coming up on the 24th at 5.30 if there's any public interested in participating. Excuse me, Ms. Panetta, that, so that's uh, animal control board, board yeah. meeting? to review the latest changes. It's their regular animal control okay. board. So I'm, I'm sure there'll be some review at that meeting, but also their regular general board meeting, so the public can come and share any new concerns. I anticipate, you know, we might have more community groups that come out. So we're, we're always open to that and encouraging it. Um, on the emergency preparedness end, uh, our emergency Preparedness section relocated a mass care shelter response trailer to the Girdwood area in collaboration with the Girdwood Fire Department. This placement provides a rapid response option south of Anchorage. 
um, in the event of Seward Highway compromise. Also, it's just closer and easier to set up. It, will, it has enough durable equipment to support up to 150 people in a community center or a school. Um, this, we think, is really important, especially with the increased uh, population and tourism in that area. Um, they've been very busy with lots of things. Internally, they've hosted um, a Stop the Bleed training and de-escalation conflict resolution. Um, we just had an increased number of escalated uh, clients and community members in our building as they always, you know, we always do, but we're working to try to continue to provide staff with um, lots of training and support. Uh, the police department came and provided de-escalation training. Um, in addition, um, I think maybe Trevor mentioned to you guys in a committee last week, Trevor Stores, that the, we received a $10,000 grant to do adverse child but experiences and trauma training. And so about, all, you know, we've got almost 100% of our staff will get an initial three hour training on ACEs and trauma, and then um, some smaller groups that are um, working more directly with different client populations will get more intensive training and some train the trainer training. Um, so that starts in November and we're really looking forward to that. Can I ask a question? Would it be possible to do uh, training for the assembly on that? Probably, yeah. We, um, since I've been here, we started doing a monthly training or continuing education thing, which Desiree and I um, work on together with Barbara, that tries to just educate the assembly about what yeah. we're working on, and I think because it touches so many aspects of things we might fund or programs mm -hmm. we might be associated with, it makes sense yeah. for us to learn that, too. I'll ask Christy if it can be added to, or if you guys can be added to one of the, the actual trainings that are already set up, or if we can set up. Yeah, usually we do it here um, on a Friday. I think we're actually all booked through February, through January. Okay. So it would be out a little ways, um, but yeah, just something great. I think we'd be interested yeah, okay. in. I'll let her know. Does that sound like something <coughs> we would want to do? I think so. That's a great idea. <coughs> okay. And you also have the DVD resilience. I'm tracking it down. Oh, but I don't. I didn't yeah. find it, but I know Shannon has one. So. Yeah. Thanks, Natasha. I was, I was like, I'm going to have to email all the staff and be like, who took the resiliency DVD? <laughs> <laughs> it is not anywhere anymore. So we will get you guys a copy, though. Great. Um, moving on to Human Services Division. Just a basic update on shelter. I know um, we were just reported it, but for those of you who weren't there, Beans Cafe will begin their services November 15th. Um, and they're just in the process of hiring and training staff. The Safety Center began offering um, a few spots available uh, October 1st um, through October 31st. And at this point, the utilization has been around 58% as of yesterday. So um, there is spots for people if they really need it. Um, and Brother Francis, is, they're working together to send people over there if they need that space. And so there's, they still have a little bit of, of space available. Um, the emergency sheltering for families at faith-based community centers was uh, started up on the 1st of October. Nine churches are approved. Um, so far, they've had an, um, six nights of, uh, they've had six families and one single pregnant disabled adult have access to church sheltering. Um, so there, it looks like there's still capacity in those locations. Lots of um, new staff in our departments. We um, have pretty much gotten to about 95% fully hired, which means we're also onboarding lots and lots of new people. Um, it's been um, a lot of uh, orientation happening. So child care licensing has two new staff. They've been very, very active. I can provide you guys with data of what they do every month. Uh, realized last month with some questions from the assembly members that there was a maybe just not a real understanding of the volume of places that they visit, the number of locations that they um, follow up with, how many um, walk-ins there are, how many complaints we have. Um, with the Community Safety and Development Team, which oversees our HUD program. We hired a Community Systems Program Manager, so they finally have a supervisor after a long time. Um, you will see the substantial amendments coming to the Assembly next month uh, for approval. It's currently still in its 30-day public comment process. Uh, the 2020 Action Plan public comment process did not develop a lot of ideas for funding, and so our team is going to be doing um, more continued outreach to develop a strong portfolio of projects for a 2020 plan. And the Housing Trust Fund RFP did yield one project with Cook Inlet Housing um, on their West 32nd project, which is a mixed income, mixed occupancy project. 
and they will be um, receiving funds for that construction on the corner of 32nd and Spinard. Senior Emergency Outreach Services, they um, in the last quarter had 244 individuals receive 1,012 referrals. And I'll just quickly wrap up here. We're in flu season. Um, and since the 11th, we've given out 1,000 flu shots. Uh, we will continue to have flu clinics throughout the city till December 11th. Many of you have probably seen the flyer. If not, I'll forward it out with all of the public locations, and those are free flu shot locations. We have three new public health nurses that have recently joined that team. We have partnerships, new partnerships emerging with Volunteers of America, the VA Hospital, the Neighborhood Health Center, and Alaska Youth Advocates. And a big thing that happened recently was that the Anchorage School District approved the teen underage pregnancy prevention healthy sexuality courses to be taught in eighth grade. They've been working on that for years. So it got through their curriculum process and is approved. Um, and I'll just end it with, uh, we did 149 kitchen inspections last month in environmental health. Um, along with a variety of other things. Um, we had 344 public encounters at the customer service desk. They're very busy. Um, and WIC continues to do lots of outreach events and is coordinating and partnering with our public health nursing team and with the Anchorage Neighborhood Health Center to help the parents and the moms that come in um, get connected with Anchorage Neighborhood Health Clinic for pediatric primary care. And that is all. Yeah, Ms. Alto. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the kitchens, and actually that was something that came up when I was reviewing the budget last night. Um, I noticed in the budget that um, the number of food facilities inspected per year always is below the minimum required by um, the code as well as by FDA. It is. Um, why? That's a good question. Um, I think they're gonna they're on track this year to meet the code. Uh, and you should see that in the next set of PBRs that come out with their quarter three numbers. What's a PBR? Oh, your performance value results. results. Yeah, they come out every quarter, and that is one of the measurements that comes every quarter. Um, and uh, so we've had lots of, we've had some leadership change over, um, and we've had Darcy Harris start about six months ago, and she has been working very hard on getting us to meet those basic requirements. Um, but on a regular basis, um, there has been a request annually. I think they need another sanitarian. But what we're doing is with the new supervisor, seeing you know what's the capacity, doing some efficiency reviews, some different management tool tasks to see how many are they supposed to do every day? How many are they really accomplishing? What are the, why is that happening? Is it because they're having too many complaints and follow-ups and other things that disallow them from meeting the expected number that they're supposed to do every day? So I think by mid of next year, um, we'll have a better sense of why we meet or don't meet that standard, but I didn't have that information kind of going into my position. And I presume that the lower, ours is in black and white, there are two lines and the black and white, so the FDA number is the higher number and the code yeah. line, okay, I presumed, but I just wanted to make sure it was right. I don't know, actually, just look at that. I don't okay. want to, I shouldn't say it. Okay, well, I can. There'll um, be a new set coming where we have them do um, in the next couple of weeks. I can just send you the colored version in there. Um, I will add that uh, title, you know, label that line um, in the report so it's easier to read. Great, thanks. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Gates. Thank you. I just was curious to follow up on that. Are the uh, health inspections funded? Are they were funded by inspection fees or are they tax funded? Uh, that's all operating funds. They do generate some revenue with the permits and fees, but it doesn't recover the cost for the actual um, work. Any sort of percentage you could estimate? Is I can guess, by but I can tell you. True. I mean, I'll find out and let you know. I'm sure Deanne has it somewhere. If you guys don't have any more questions, I was curious about the ASD um, teen pregnancy program. So is that essentially like a sex ed program? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's one that we do and have been doing for years and it's a, you know, we get the resources from the state and it's approved curriculum from them. Um, and we do it in a variety of different settings with, you know, high, to use the word at risk or high risk youth, but that's generally where we've been allowed to do teen pregnancy prevention curriculum. Um, 
because the process to get through the school district approval is lengthy. So they completed that, and now they'll be able to do it in all the schools. So it's only for some students? Yeah, eighth graders. Oh, but not just high-risk populations. No, it's, it's for, for whole, everyone. For but students. until you get through the approval process, then the era is an allowable curriculum. Um, in the past, we had uh, we did have staff that went out, and we had nurses and others that did education in the school district. But there was a variety of changes in the rules and how you what gets approved and how it gets approved and who can teach in the schools. And so there was just a period of time where we weren't able to do that. And now we have an approved curriculum. So. And was that because of state law changes? There were state law changes. I don't have them. I don't remember exactly when that happened, but then it caused this period of time where we weren't having as much education and outreach under that grant simply because we didn't have the venues with the volume of you. Great. Well, that's good news. It's back. Yeah. Okay. If there are no other questions, let's move on to the Vera Clinic report. Sure. So, again, I'm Ben Slager, and I work for Maryland Health. Um, I'm going to do a report back on the first year of uh, MOA's Maryland Health Clinic. So just for some context, uh, we opened that clinic up at the very end of February of 2018. And that was uh, open for members that are on MOA-sponsored health plans, uh, employees, spouses, and dependents. Um, so we're going to take a look at some utilization data for that first year. That time period is again March 1st, 2018. 2019. Um, we'll look at some patient satisfaction data and then some of the cost outcomes as well. Um, so on this first slide, I'm just going to give a really high level overview of uh, year one. We had a patient satisfaction score of four and a half out of five on a scale of one to one five, not one to ten, don't worry. Um, this is really good for the healthcare industry um, and this is right on par with what our book of business is. Um, and so that's like after a service, someone correct. you ask yep. them. So is it only people who self-select to do the survey? Correct. Yep. It gets sent to everybody after every appointment. But it's hard to know if those people are really mad people or really happy people. Yeah, it's true. But I would we, assume the people in the middle are like, I don't really care. We get a really high response rate. It's over 50%, <laughs> which is really surprising for uh, oh, people going wow. out surveys. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We had a total of 4,377 appointments. Those were spread across 1,164 patients, and uh, we ended that first year with 51% employee engagement. That means 51% uh, of all eligible employees had one face-to-face -face encounter with Vera. So we'll dig into it a little bit more here. Yes, oh, sorry, right. question. Just so you know, it's, it, you have oh, to hand yeah, it to yeah. as well. Thank so, you. Yeah. And did you, so the extras, are they on the table for members of the public? They're over here. I handed some out early, but there's also some extras here, yeah. Yeah, if you could just send them over there, that'd be great. Thanks. So this is looking at the first 12 months of employee engagement. Again, engagement is considered any one face-to-face -face encounter at Vera or an on-site event. Um, we ended the year at 51% employee engagement. That's 897 employees. Um, the top right there, I show that our baseline for clients of a similar size and makeup is about 45%, so you're a little bit higher there. Um, this next slide is looking at the same timeline, but just focusing on spouse and dependent engagement. We ended the year at 10%, 263 total spouses and dependents. Um, uh, for our book of business, uh, we're usually close to 19%. I think the biggest factor in this one is um, we didn't offer an incentive for spouses, which we almost always do with a lot of our other clients. So that's something we'll actually be looking at in the future. I think Mr. Falsey's wife told me about that lack yeah. of incentive for her. Yeah. <laughs> um, did you have a question? Yeah. I would assume that this ramps up that you probably don't start with people and be using it immediately, right? So your 19 might be your average, but that might be with a clinic that's functioning for, that's for two first or three years. That's oh, just, it is yeah, the first, first year. year. Okay. Yep. Yep. Got it. Thank you. Yep. Good question. Um, this next slide is looking at that demand spaced out over a 12-month period. So that blue section underneath is the distinct number of patients coming in every month. And then the blue section is the total number of appointments by those distinct patients. You'll see on average, we saw about 185 distinct patients every month. 
Um, and most distinct patients had on average about 365 total appointments for the month. Um, and then there's a big spike there in October and November. Um, and that's when the incentive deadline was, so that's a you know, big factor in tracking folks into the clinic. I think Ms. LaFrance has a yeah. question. Thank you. She's not as loud as I That's am. It's okay. <laughs> Just interrupt whenever you need. <laughs> okay. Um, so going back to the other slide about mm -hmm. the 10% um, engagement, mm -hmm. the rest, the 90% that's not engaged, mm -hmm. are they then, do, do you know, and I understand you're dealing with the VERA numbers, but right. is that, maybe that's a question for Ms. Uh, Penny, is that 90% seeking services elsewhere? Because I know some people just don't use right. medical for accessing. Yeah. It, it basically that, is folks who just aren't going. Yeah. Not necessarily, they may be going to another primary care provider or not going at all. We okay. just know that 10% of them are using okay. the beer. But your baseline should kind of take care of that because on, in an average clinic, it's 19%. So regardless of why people are coming or not, it should be at about that level. Yeah, right? and there's, I mean, there's a lot of different factors. You know, access to communication to spouses depends on the organization. Some have you know, better channels than others. Uh, geographic location, I think mm -hmm. Anchorage has a lot more people spread out, and so it's a lot more difficult to get into a clinic in downtown Anchorage than you know, they live over the border. So there's a few different factors in that as well. Why don't we do a, a family incentive? Uh, we are We're looking at that for next week. And okay. there, there are some logistical things that cause some issues for us, for instance, if the spouse is an employee of the municipality, we have to do a 1099 at the end of the year. For the cost of that? Mm -hmm. for, that for the $200 incentive that we would offer. So we're looking at some different ways that we may be able to incentivize them without actually giving them funds. Do, um, in the other clinics where you have a spouse and family incentive, is that the model? Well, it depends. Uh, it's not all our government agencies. We have um, another um, city of Kirkland actually has an incentive that's based on if you're an individual in the plan, it's a certain amount, um, and that it's the same amount for spouse and employee, but that's getting, it's paid out through the yeah through their paycheck. Oh. Um, we've also used. Are we um, looking at? I mean, that makes sense, right? Yeah, we're, we're also considering that. cash cards. Um, so it might be another way around it. That's what yeah. the school district does. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I've been in a plan that does that. It seems, yeah, it seems sort of like easy, right? You just do that instead of paying them. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it, it is definitely something that we're looking yeah. at for next year. It's probably one of our biggest priorities for next year. Great. Yeah. Thanks. You can tell Jeanette that film. <laughs> <laughs> Again, this was a total of 4,377 appointments split across 1,164 people. Uh, on average, there were a little over three and a half appointments per person. Um, and this is AWHE completion, and what that acronym stands for is the Annual Whole Health Evaluation. That's made up of four parts, um, and that's what we incentivize people to do every year, um, or at least employees. Is uh, that how you get the incentive? Yes, correct. Oh, yes. Yep. So it's made up of four parts. The provider wellness visit, which is a 16-minute appointment with the provider. Biometric screening, which is usually a 15-minute appointment. It's a finger stick where people get their, you know, their blood glucose, lipids, all that stuff. Um, uh, a coaching appointment with one of our health coaches. Um, usually a 15-minute introduction to coaching where they can figure out if health coaching makes sense for them. And then an online health assessment. So those are the four parts that make up the annual World health evaluation, or the AWHE for short. Um, and then this is looking at how many people completed those, those four parts. 70% um, of people who started it completed it, 20% completed three, and then 5% uh, just two there. Yeah, really, really high numbers. I think this is one of the highest benchmarks I've seen in terms of people completing. Yeah. And wait, how much is the incentive? 100 or 200 or 200 dollars? Annually. Um, so just a quick little snapshot on patient satisfaction. I pulled out a uh, patient testimonial. We give these all the time. If I ever have a bad day, I can just go read patient testimonials and make me feel better about my work. Um, this one is a uh, quote. I am a 43-year-old man. During my visit, I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. This is the first time in years I have gotten blood work done, so the $200 incentive may have saved my life. Is this a patient from our Vera Correct. Yes. 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 
It's one of our employees. Yeah, and th this isn't an unusual growth thing. We get these all the time. It's really, it's really cool. Um, and then just looking at patient satisfaction numbers for that first year, these are all on a scale of one to five. Uh, 4.5 out of five for um, scores on the, regarding the care team. So I think allied staff and, and people doing the check-in process. Um, our provider score was uh, almost 4.6 out of five. Um, health coach was a little bit lower at 4.35, but the reason that one was a little bit lower is uh, a lot of people don't know what health coaching is. And so one of the questions about that is, did uh, your appointment meet your expectations? So I think that drags the score down a little bit just because people don't have a lot of expectations or have different expectations about the health coach and what, what health is, coaching is. What is health coaching? Yeah, that's a great question. It's really around- um, Very relevant. Yeah, people, <laughs> helping people set goals. So think of it like kind of an accountability partner, but focused on their health and well-being. Um, health coach will you know, help you create an action plan and work towards a particular goal. It's a bit vague because it can be just about anything. So you come out of your provider exam and maybe you need to work on your blood sugar or weight loss or stress prevention or having some family issues. Um, they'll work with you to create a plan to work towards that. And then if you kind of sign on with them, you'll have um, anywhere from six to eight or even 10 um, follow-up visits where you'll work on this plan and then kind of um, work towards specific goals that you can create along with your coach. So that's it at a really high level. Does the Bear Clinic provide both physical health and mental health services or just physical? Um, nothing specific to behavioral health, but I would say there's a huge component to primary care that, that impacts um, mental health care as well. So there's no specialist in the clinic, but a big part of your um, exam is getting to like the biopsychosocial aspect of your life. And so when they're asking questions during your 60 minute provider exam, they're peeling back the layers on like what's going on in your personal life mm -hmm. because they know that mental health is a direct contributor to a lot of your physical illness as well. So that's definitely a part of primary care, but it's not like we have a psychiatrist mm -hmm. um, on the staff. Sounds great, yeah. thank you. And then the last score is just around the overall patient experience, which was just under 4.5 as well. So now I'll jump into just a kind of high level look at cost analysis. And this is just looking again at the first year. Um, usually we see some cost savings in the first year, although um, we don't guarantee it until year three. So just, you know, built into your contract is a cost guarantee. So if we don't save you money by the end of the third year, um, Can you talk a little bit more about, I know at least both Ms. Alatel and I are came after sure. the Air Clinic was established, so would you mind just taking a minute or two about sort of the structure and those sorts of things? Yeah, and, sure um, understand. let me walk through this, okay. and I think it might answer some questions, cool. and then we come, we come back. That's great. If that's okay. Yeah. So looking at this data, there's just some assumptions and definitions. Um, we consider someone engaged to have at least one unique face-to-face -face encounter. I mentioned that earlier. Um, this data includes all members that are above the ages of three because we don't see uh, pediatrics, so we don't see under three. We can see three and above for acute care needs. Um, we're just looking at Alaska members. There's some members on the plan that reside outside of the state, but as you might imagine, their engagement was extremely low because they didn't have access to the clinic, so we removed them all from the data set. This is based on paid claims, um, and where we list that we removed outliers, it is any claimants that were Above. So just Wait, a can I ask a question? So you remove them from like Sometimes. satisfaction and all of these no, things no, no, you're no. showing Just on the financial aspect. So that's a data file that comes from Primera Blue Cross on the paid okay. claims for the time mm -hmm. period we um, looked at. So they're looking at claims that were paid Correct. under the health Got plan. It. Yep. So this is a sort of primer to whatever you're going to talk about Correct. next, which that's, is financial. That's not. Okay. That's not. Got it. Thank yeah. you. So this is just kind of a financial summary of your medical and prescription uh, paid claims over the past three calendar years. So this is a slightly different time frame than what we're looking at. Um, but you can see the total that the plan paid um, was at 50 million in 2016 and then dropped to 42 million and then 40, uh, just under 42 million in 2018. So a really good trend. Now, the number of people enrolled on MOA sponsored health plans did drop. So we're also looking at the total paid per member per month, that's what PM, no, PM that's stands great. for. Um, but even here, you saw significant um, decreases over the years. You went from 806 per member per month down 
on the 684 and 662. Um, uh, and then we break this out by medical and prescription, just so you can see the two different sides. So to begin with, this is an unusual case for us. Usually we see an accelerating trend of spend. Um, people start going. Exactly, yeah. and then they look to us for an intervention to help drive down costs. So we have to kind of rethink how we show cost savings because we usually use a historical trend method to establish a trend and then measure ourselves against that. So I just wanted and, to... And just to give you a little bit of background, in 2016, we moved from Moda Healthcare to Premier Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alaska okay. as our third party administrator. And they have much better network contracts than Moda has and had, thus the lowering of the trend, if you will. And then the second thing was we had one large union leave the MOA health plan um, January 1st, 16, and their utilization from the prior year skyrocketed which caused the, the, and we also okay. had several preemie babies that year. Yeah. So when, the, again, just to, so the clinic was put in place, so this is looking at Primera's claims specifically, all of the, the health claims coming through on the Primera data. So that's what these numbers are. And then the clinic was put in place in 18. March of 18. Yep. So now they're gonna um, show kind of what that impact um, might look like. So this is a historical viewpoint of the claims. So, so looking at 17 and 18 is maybe more reasonable comparison because that's without the correct trainees and unions yes and Mona to yeah to correct. and then to put it in perspective like a, a national average of trend um, is running around eight percent overall on claims so one would see an eight percent increase year over year on claims so having the municipality have a decrease in those claims is is an um, unusual as well. So. so why do you think there's a decrease from 17 to 18? Because the clinic hadn't even started, right? So there's just a decrease in general. The clinic started uh, March, March of 18. 2018. So there's a portion of that in there. We, we didn't have any large claimants in, in 2017. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Or in 2018. It has to do with the type of claimants and claims running through the, um, the system. Um, and then the impact of Primera continues to build out their network as well and build those um, provider contracts um, out there and make improvements. Uh, there's also a travel component that kind of gets mixed in there. So there's a conglomeration of just the management that's being done of your health, of the um, of the municipality's plan as well. So this uh, number in 2018, the 41 odd million, that's the total amount then that the MOA has claims. Okay. So that includes also the Bureau. No, not yet. No, not yet. No, not yet. No, not yet. This not is yet. through Premier. Yeah, these okay. are just the pay claims through Premier. Okay, mm -hmm. got it. Thanks. So we'll jump to this next slide, and I'll I'll walk us through this because there's a lot going on. So I just want to start out by saying at the top it is giving a definition of the data set. So we're looking at any eligibility. We're excluding those outliers that we talked about, so those hundred thousand plus claimants, and we're risk adjusting it. Uh, and you're taking 100,000 out just because they throw off averages. Right. It actually makes us look a lot better, but we feel like it skews the data because you can have, you know, some really high cost individuals yeah. that skew the data and you yeah. aren't really getting a good snapshot of the actual population. Do you take the 100K people out of the Blue Cross Blue Shield too? Uh, we, so this is looking at paid claims. Um, so, it, yes, it's everybody. Yes, that's okay. that is who they're just taking. To make sure yeah. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. So how we judge ourselves is, so the clinic opens right here. We look at the previous 24 months of paid claims. Um, we kind of saw a snapshot of that before, but th these are paid claims jumping up and down, and this is the trend line. Again, we were seeing a downward trend, which is something we've never seen before when we measure ourselves against the historical average. And the trend is overall cost per patient. Right. That's what the baseline is. Yep, yep. It's per member per month. Yep. Okay. Um, so it was going to be impossible, essentially, for ourselves to judge over a significant period of time of a downward trajectory. So we're measuring ourselves against the average increase in the Anchorage market, which is 13.5%. So that's what this line is. We're saying, uh, eventually, your costs were likely going to move towards the mean of what this uh, area is seen. So we're measuring ourselves against that established trend right there, which is the Anchorage market rate. Um, and then these are the actual claims since the clinic opened. So then we move to the math. 
Um, and we're taking what we expected the per participant, or per member, PPPM is the same as PMPM. Um, we expected it to be at $573 per member per month. We actually had 496 per member per month, which gives you a gross savings of about $76. You multiply that out across the total eligible number of lives of people in the plan, you get a gross savings number, and then you bake in the clinic operating costs, the pass-through costs of prescription and labs, and then we amortize out the startup cost of the clinic over a three-year period, so this is a third of the startup costs, and then that gives us our net savings of 1.3 million. And that's since it started. Since it started through February of 2019. So we're just Not looking at 12 months. Yeah, yeah, the first, first 12 months. Uh, and do you, so that 13.5%, that is what all the other plans in Anchorage, in the Anchorage market went up by? That's yes. the trend. Yes. Yeah, that's the, that's the average for the Anchorage market, yes. You'll see some that were much higher than that and some that were lower. Yeah, 8%, yeah. Uh, Sheree was saying, is national average that's Anchorage national. Is, is much higher. And Anchorage is higher. And are, do we normally see the average in our plans? Like, are we normally around 13? I'm just wondering whether that's a real number to use. Like, sure. maybe for some reason the municipality of Anchorage average is different of rising or lowering. It bounces around, to be honest with you. Okay. So sometimes it's higher. Right now it's lower. Yeah. Our renewal for next year is 2.2%, which is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Last year it was 2.5%. So right now we're trending very well against the national average and against uh, the Anchorage average. Yeah, because it's kind of all in that what percentage you right. use, and it so is. if ours is really only going up by 2.2%, that's not Primera really uses, a fair comparison. Primera's around 13% is what their, um, what their book of business, what book of business trend um, is. Mm -hmm. And the GDP was, or the uh, medical Medical CPIU was 7.6% for 2018. Yeah, I don't know enough about the healthcare market to understand yeah. what percentage we should be using, but it seems like these results are all based on whatever percentage you pick. Correct. So, yes. anybody else have any questions about that? Do you know what the numbers would be if we use 2.2%? I don't off the top of my head. I know we also looked at 8%, yeah. and there was also savings via that method as well. Um, and then looking at where those savings came from, based on that assumption, um, the total savings again per member per month was about $76. Um, and then we show these breakouts by point of service. So the biggest savings were on the pharmacy end, uh, professional service, which is specialty uh, care, family outpatient was at $12, and facility inpatient was at 8 So those are the biggest kind of areas where you saw savings against what we would have expected. Stuck on the last slide. This one? And about um, Ms. Quinn Davis's point about you know what you assume sure. for the renewal rate. And we were talking when we say the 2.2, we're talking about the cost we expect or the percentage we expect the cost to increase by, right? 2.2 um, and 13 percent. I mean that's a that's a huge disparity. Um, the the 2.2% is based on our performance of the plan. Okay. So what, basically what that means is if we had the exact same claims today or next year that we have today, we would anticipate they're only going to go up 2.2%. Well, well, and based on your based on your funding. So your right. your funding right now you have some reserve that's sitting out there within your funding rates. And so the only, the needed amount is going up by 2.2% on your funding rate. So that's what that 2.2% is. It's not necessarily the claims trend. We are seeing your claims trend as actually going down a little bit even um, this year. So um, that is, and I think part of that is gonna be an impact with um, the clinic. And when we take a look at the, the claims, including the clinic expenses, there is still a decline in that trend number. It's it's almost a break even, but it's like a point. It's like a half a percent lower than previous year on claim trend. So that's kind of we would look and go, okay, well, there's 
there is probably an impact, a positive impact um, coming from the clinic um, because there's expenses there are going to be less expensive than expenses out in the market um, for some of the care that's taking place. So. Okay. Well, and it seems to some extent like we're not going to know in the first year, right? Sure. This is that's something correct. we just have yes. to say. Yeah. I don't know. That's why I don't guarantee anything until yeah. three. So all this right. takes time, right? we got a bunch of people at the end of the year in the preventive right. and it takes a while to manage their care, get them specialist also yeah. a lot of times you see an increase in cost that first year because of all these people who had been going to see the doctor are and they're getting diagnosed with a lot of things that have just been underneath mm -hmm. the surface they were going to cost the planet at some point yeah. mm -hmm. but suddenly it's all coming out right now so it, it is a long-term mm -hmm. decision yes. to lower cost over time yeah. I just want to note that mr. Weddleton is here he might have been here for a while um, okay <laughs> uh, can I ask then so how does so you guys are a, what's, what is your clinic? It's like a, you're probably a non-profit even though. We're, we're for profit, but we're, we're a near site or on-site primary care provider. Yeah. So your deal is you come to, to government entities or private and mm -hmm. say, we'll start a clinic mm -hmm. and in three years, if your costs go down, do you guys keep the, this 1.4 or does that go to the muni? Like how do you make your money? Yeah, that goes to the muni. So we charge a flat per member per uh, for everyone that's eligible for the clinic, okay. and then we directly pass through clinic costs. So staff. Any savings to? Well, oh. I'm saying at the, the clinic, so okay. like the expenses, the expenses directly through. So. So the Muni pays to run it. The mm -hmm. Muni realizes any savings minus the per PP whatever mm -hmm. um, yep. cost. Yep. And then if there aren't savings mm -hmm. over time, yes. what happens? We would pay that back to you. So do you guarantee a certain rate of savings, or you just guarantee that it will go up? Or Correct. We just guarantee that you will save money on top of paying for us. And that's like an individually negotiated contract with right. different yeah. players depending yep. on the market. Yep. And, yep. and this was a contract that we originally had with the school district, and then um, you guys essentially mirrored that contract. So we have the same setup with the school district. That's why there's two clinics in Anchorage. So one was sponsored by the Anchorage School District, and one is sponsored oh. by you. If reciprocity is well, so you can use that clinic. Yeah. Um, you Hi, thank tell you. Yeah. Um, so the contracts are they negotiated? You know, for the rates um, and the like. Every we I mean, really have three-year cost three savings years. to be yep. to start. Is that so? Is it negotiated for the three years at the outset, or is it yes? Used? Okay. And then um, it has uh, automatic one one year renewals, and okay. otherwise we can also you know. And does the that. contract typically have any kind of? Um, Escalator and costs related to uh, general market trends or something else where we're just going to pay more automatically as it goes on? Um, there's nothing the built into the okay. contract for that, no. Yeah, so you, you'd roll over with the same cost. Okay. Just unless we renegotiated, yeah. So who got this going? Who, whose idea was this? Great question. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> the Anchorage School District negotiated their contract first and then we looked when we looked at our data with the Wilson agency we saw that almost 70 percent of our adult population had not had a physical exam in over two years mm -hmm. so we knew we needed to do something mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. take down the barriers to mm -hmm. getting health care so with the executive health care committee which included um, Bill Falsey Lance Wilbur kind of the eighth floor we said what do you think can we do this and they said well let's 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 do it let's see if we can make it work so we implemented it in 2018. Yeah. Yeah. And I Bill's usually in there if it's a good idea. And looking at and I didn't actually bring before you go. Yes. Um, we're getting a little over time. We started a little late, but maybe we could extend for five more minutes and yeah, finish up. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Go ahead. Oh yeah. So I didn't bring the data with me, but we have seen a positive um, increase on the number of people getting their preventive care. So we are asked. We are getting to people that weren't getting their care before that have now gone in and, and yeah. received preventive care. And, and our diabetic is one example, and we also had a patient who hadn't been to a physician in years and discovered that he had prostate cancer. Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah, so it's those sorts of things that are going to over time save the plan money. We're really but driving people long, away here. Yeah, <laughs> it is a long term. Um, yeah. yeah, and I don't have any of our quality data, but like one of the things we were is like a big thing that we're tracking on is cancer screening rates mm -hmm. and making sure that we're you know 
the 90th percentile or above for a lot of the cancer screening rates, Vac vaccinations, um, managing you know complex conditions. So mm -hmm. those are all things that we're working on. Um, and do you, if you look at the rates of people engaged versus non-engaged, because we look at claims data, mm -hmm. um, the people that are engaged are meeting those at a much much higher level than people who are not engaged, which you might expect. So that's just another thing that we're constantly. Which over time is it? Absolutely. Yeah. Felix, are you still there and did you have any questions? No, I don't have any questions at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, is Eugene still here? No. Okay, so we could do public participation, but in, if you wanted to say anything or. I'm with the benefits team. Okay. You <laughs> um, can still say something. <laughs> <laughs> it's a safe space. Well, I, yeah. I, you know, I, I, uh, all I can really say is how much I strongly support clinic and I get a lot of really incredible feedback from our Great. employees. And, and I would like to add that Beth actually came to us from the Anchorage School District. So she was at the school district when they opened right. their bureau. So home. maybe she brought the idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> can you remind me where the two locations are? Yes, there's one in Muldoon. Okay. And the other one is on 36th okay. uh, in Midtown. Midtown. So, so that's we'll, great because, um, sorry, no. Nope. Um, I have access to a clinic through my husband's insurance, but it is so far, I mean, it's on way, way in northeast Anchorage that a lot of times we don't go just because it takes so much time to get there and to walk in. So the convenience part, I think, is huge to be centrally located like that. So yeah, with the Muldoon, we went the school districts because they have their There's center there, and then you guys did it. We looked at the, we the, look at the demographics of where all of our employees are and where oh, all of the cool. employees of Anchorage School District are, and we found that over 50% of our employees and their employees are in the kind of northeast corridor, if you will, the river, et cetera. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, I don't think there's any other business. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Anyone want to talk about anything else? Mr. Falsy doesn't. Well, just as a, yeah, a summary statement then, is it safe to say that we are saving money on this, or is it too soon? I think we are saving money. Um, with some of the statistics that you saw, I think you'll see a greater savings as we move forward. Yeah, year two and year three, I think like, is where it's really going to bear fruit for cost savings. Thank you. Yeah. And again, Great. the health of our employees. Yeah. Yeah. Can't forget that. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, if there are no other questions, I think we'll go ahead and adjourn. Does that sound good to everyone? Okay. Thank you.